This episode is proudly supported by Powerhouse Parramatta. Powerhouse Parramatta will open in 2025. The new museum will be the largest in New South Wales and is determined to offer the very best in hospitality. Perhaps your business can be part of defining a food and beverage offering which is expected to cater to 2 million visitors a year. This incredible opportunity for operators includes retail food and beverage, in-house residential catering, events and other hospitality ventures, encapsulating the diversity of cuisines and cultures that make Western Sydney so exciting. Interested to learn more? Powerhouse invites food and beverage operators to a briefing on Tuesday 8th of August. For more information and to register for this exclusive briefing, go to powerhouse.com. You're looking across, you know, the catchment and you're thinking about these things at play. You know, you're wondering how do they work, you know, how have those flavours arrived in this oyster? It's like artistry, right? You know, like, you've got to be creative. And in order to be creative, you need to think deeply about something and, and then carry that forward. This is Fishtails, a seafood podcast I'm John Sussman. The Sydney rock oyster, or Secostria glomerata, is indigenous to the 1500 kilometres of eastern Australian coastline, from Moreton Bay in southeast Queensland to the Mallacoota Inlet on the New South Wales Victorian border. Aboriginal Australians consumed oysters for thousands of years before European settlement, as indicated by the large number of kitchen middens remaining along Australia's east coast. The early settlers of New South Wales soon discovered this delicious and unique bivalve and with a rapidly increasing population, the demand for rock oysters grew quickly. Oyster farming now employs many different techniques, all of which take place on selected sites held under about 3,200 aquaculture leases with a total current area of about 4,300 hectares. Commercial rock oyster production in New South Wales occurs in 41 estuaries between Eden in the south to the Tweed River in the north. Today, rock oysters have rightly claimed their position as one of the true seafood luxuries to be found in Australia, with many restaurants and retailers offering a selection of rock oysters from different estuaries produced by different growers using different techniques. John Blankenstein is one of this next generation of oyster farmers, a passionate environmentalist expert and enthusiastic outdoorsman and true lover of the art of growing award-winning oysters. I'm John Blankenstein, I'm a rock oyster farmer. I farm on Wappingo Lake on the far south coast of New South Wales. My introduction to rock oyster farming was purely built out of the desire to for a lifestyle change um, and it sort of led me down down the road, um, always had a bit of a passion in uh, in the natural world, um, and particularly had an interest just in aquaculture. But um, wanting to work locally around where I live, I live on the back of Nelson's Lagoon, um, so I set about the task of uh, searching for water, um, looking high, looking low, um, and eventually. I managed to um, locate some water and um, hassle the individual enough where he um, decided that he'd, he'd sell to me, and that's that's kind of how how I got the ball rolling. Going on probably close to close to seven years now. Nelson Lagoon is is, is it's 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 a very um, special um, estuary in that. Um, there's, well, there's, there's probably no estuary like it on the east coast of Australia. Um, first and foremost, it's it's about 99% encapsulated within the confines of a national park, um, other than myself and my neighbour, which which um, adjoin adjoin the park. My property is bordered on three sides by the park, and um, and one side's my neighbour, and then he's bordered on the park and you know we're located up the back of the estuary but Nelson's is is, is special it's a, it's a it's a bit of a window into the past um you know the environment and the ecology um which is present today um is the result of you know thousands and thousands of years of of evolution and and outside of um you know the odd road um management road 
it's very limited to the mark of man, which is, you know, it's pretty uncommon this day and age when you, when you think about it. You know, we're, we're in the we're in the year 2000, um, you know, so, it, it, so it's nice to have a, a wild place um, that's, uh, that exists, you know, in its entirety. No, I'm not. So I was, um, I was born in, um, in Melbourne, actually, in the eastern suburbs of, of Mitcham. Um, but I, um, I grew up in South Gippsland. Um, and then we used to holiday, um, me and my mates, we used to pack the boards and head up to Marimbula and Tarth for surfing. And, um, back then I was, um, I was plumbing, um, I'm a plumber by trade, but I always just say to myself, oh, I'm, I'm going to move up here. I'm going to, um, start a business, a plumbing business on the far South coast. And, um, yeah, that's how I ended up here. For much of the first 200 years of settlement in Australia, oyster farming was an intergenerational right. The past 30 years has seen an explosion in the growth of artisan farmers who come to oyster farming with fresh eyes, a keenness to innovate and are driven by the pursuit of excellence. The the thought of getting in, becoming an oyster farmer, um, the conversation was kicked around the campfire with a mate of mine up in the um, the jungle wilderness area of the Kosciuszko National Park. I like fly fishing and I love the remoteness. Um, And at the time I was running a a pretty big commercial plumbing company um, in the ACT. Um, And I was a bit burnt out, you know, I'd been doing it, uh, traveling, you know, the the work area I used to cover was about a 400K radius. I had lots of people and a lot of stress, but um, a lot of time away from the family. Um, and more importantly, a lot of time away from the things that were important to me. Um, and so you get to a point in life and you just think, you know, why am I doing this? You know, like life short. So um, I had a degree in natural resource management. So I've always had an affinity with the environment. Um I never went down the aquaculture stream, but I worked in natural resource management. I actually was appointed as a um, as as a ranger for Park Victoria. I, I managed the alpine area of uh, Tingaringi, which is a really remote uh, outpost uh, outpost in um, northeast Victoria for a while. But as a young guy, there was very little opportunities. I, I definitely never would have come across a um, suitable female. So I um I left and. Um, you know, started plumbing on the far south coast but you know fast forward like it, it all caught up with me mate and <clears throat> you know and, and even to this day you know like you got to keep yourself in check you know if you keep denying yourself of those internal drivers then you know you, you'll go mad you know so um so i th- you know i threw everything into aquaculture i thought yeah great you know i love the water i love the environment um and i love the process but not only that, you know, like to be a good farmer, John, I think um, it's it's more than just, you know, trying to kick out something to, to market. It's about understanding the ecology, the critical food webs. You know, it's about wondering about those processes at play. You know, they, they happen on a microscopic level. So you, you've got to romanticise about, you know, about that oyster feeding, about its requirements, you know, and then, and then think about the terrestrial and the oceanic, and all and all these things. You know, like it's yeah, it's 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 a kaleidoscope of, of things. You know, and we've we've spoken about it. You talk about it. You know, those subtle nuances that exist. So, it's about recognizing ourselves and how we fit into the natural world, and and how we bring people back to the wild, and you know, how do we display that on the plate? You know, for the consumer to interpret. Um, it's complicated, but. But they're the drivers. That's how. That's that's why I got into aquaculture. You know, like we couldn't cover it in the podcast. Starting out to develop an oyster farm from virgin water, with limited knowledge and no experience in the category, takes courage, persistence, and a skin as thick as an oyster shell. With a burning desire to do the best he could, John's approach to starting out is a story as inspiring as it is admirable. Well, day one, I didn't have much of an idea. I, um, I looked over this um, derelict expanse of water that, you know, I call it the water of broken dreams. You know, many farmers had, had been and gone and never really made um, a show of it. But I saw value 
in it. Um, and so I set about the task, you know, I, I set about the task of trying to acquire knowledge and, and how do we acquire knowledge? Well, the best way to do that is to knock on people's doors and, and tap into that historical knowledge, you know, like on the far south coast, you know, there's, there's a long history of oyster farming. Um, and a lot of those trade secrets are tied up in, in, in people's minds, you know, and, and oyster farmers aren't really open about, you know, giving away their, their secrets. But um, I made it my, you know, the, my task just to keep grinding away through sheer grit, you know, and, and to be accepted and ask the right questions and, you know, patiently observe, but also um, interact, you know, with, with other farmers and, and, you know, take note where I could take note. And then, you know, then you learn by doing, you know, like, the, and, you know, after you've killed a few thousand oysters, you, you know, you, you slowly but surely work out, you know, what you're doing wrong. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just a process of um, trial and error. It was for me, but, but then, you know, of late now I'm leaning more on the, on the science, um, you know, trying to understand the environment better. Um, you know, husbandry is key, environment's key, species is key, but how all those things interact. I think that's, um, you know, that, 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 that's something we, you know, as, as, as an industry really, you know, really need to lean on and, and probe a little deeper into if we, if we, you know, we're going to be successful and have longevity in the industry, the environment, you know, it's harsh. It, it doesn't care whether you've got rent to pay, doesn't care whether you've got, you know, bills and kids need to be fed. Um, it moves to its own beat. Um, and it does what it does. And, and so, you know, it, you know, whether it's, you know, call it my failure to adapt and to diversify, you know, to find enough market, you know, when there wasn't market, um, you know, you know, in, ret- in hindsight, I look back, you know, there's a lot of things I, you know, could have, could have done, should have done, but, you know, I think I've also done a lot of good and I've achieved a lot in a short amount of time. Um, but you know, first and foremost, I, I think the biggest challenge is is, is working with the in, worth, working with the environment. But also, you know, the industry is challenging as well, mate. Um, you know, the industry isn't squeaky clean. You know, I think you know, at this day and age, you know, if we we want to champion something as as phenomenal as the species which the rock oyster is, you know, this fine food that gets acknowledged at, you know, these prestigious awards like the RAS, you know, that, you know, you see it, you know, these these um, beautiful bivalves on, you know, on the plate, you know, they come in at five, six, seven, eight dollars a piece. It's about understanding why, you know, and each, each oyster um, tells its own story, you know, through its flavour um, and also through the story um, from the way in which it was grown. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's still a lot of work there to be done in respect to, um, how we can continue to champion the industry, but also, you know, the oyster farmer, you know, out in the water, who's, you know, sort of working in the wind and the elements all day, every day, what do they say? Healthy people, healthy farmers, healthy environment, healthy industry. So, you know, I think we need to bring our attention um, you know, across uh, across the industry in, in in a broad in a more broader context, you know, as, as to how we all interact with each other and, and and how we can, you know, work to see everyone benefit and succeed. The modern oyster farmer is as studied and determined as the modern vineyard aware of the geography, the geology, and the hydrology of the estuary in which they farm. Their days are as much driven by the seasons as they are bullied by the weather conditions and market demands. There is no such thing as a typical day for an oyster farmer pursuing to grow excellent oysters. It depends what we're doing, you know, like whether we're, you know, because growing an oyster is not something that happens overnight. It's, it's, you know, it's careful work over a period of, you know, two and a half to three to four years, depending on um, what type of grower you are. 
you know, I truly believe that, you know, the best oysters are that three, three and a half to four year old. But um, from a commercial point of view, it's, it's, it's hard to maintain that momentum. Um, so, you know, two and a half to three years. Um, so basically um, any day could, you know, look like we're out on the water, we're, we're, we're tending to stock or we're, we're setting up our catching slats, which, you know, all oysters are wild caught. So, you know, we strategically place um, slats out in areas um, in, um, well, around Je- January, February, um, March at the latest to, to get a catch so we can get our next year's crop and then um, es- 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 essentially it's, then, then it's then it's grading out and working your oysters, um, you know, keeping the right size oysters with the right size oysters. So, um, you know, keep keeping a, you know a level of continuity between you know what um, all your grades, um, and and in that you know you're tending to your stock. So you know, like as a farmer, it's important. You know, you can't have this this mentality of set and forget. Um, it's hands on. So you know whether we you know we, we're flipping bags for drying um you know or you know or we're grading out and you know um trying to move oysters and select oysters for you know for um planned harvests um and so forth so yeah it's 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 just continual work but look john so it's a lot of manual labor essentially is what it comes down to in my opinion the rock oyster offers the most unique exotic and differentiated flavors and textures of any oyster to be found in the world with rich mineral flavours, often with vegetal, creamy notes, uncommon to the Pacific species, which makes up more than 97% of global production. What is amazing about the rock oyster is how it reflects the habitat they grow in, the plant vegetation heavily influencing the algae the oysters feed on, giving those layers of flavours and complexities that are completely unique to Australia flora and terroir. I think the complexity defines a rock oyster. it's ancient. It evolved over millions and millions of years. It's it's Australian, you know. It's essentially a window into the past, um, and it's a window into the future, you know. And 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 it's an environmental indicator, and and all these things. But the the flavour profiles, um, you know, that, that elevate an oyster. I've eaten a lot of oysters, but there are no oysters that 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 have the same complexities and flavour profiles of a rock oyster. You know, there's layers on layers and layers. And and it's specific to each estuary, um, you know, as you're well aware. Um, but I don't think all consumers are, you know. And and it's aged, you know. It's 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 a slow-growing morsel, you know. And, and it's filter feeding, you know, litres and litres and litres of water a day, you know. And those flavours are running over its gills, through its, over the abductor, you know, you know, moving through its its heart and getting pumped back out, you know, day in, day out, year in, year out. And, you know, with that flow of food comes flavours. And, you know, that's encapsulated within the body of the oyster. And and, and that and there lies the prize, you know, is, is breaking down those flavours. You know, you shut your eyes, you eat it. And, and how do you define the taste, you know, the, all those things, you know, it's, yeah, it, you know, it's 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 special. You know, it really is, and you know, we're lucky to to be able to um to lay claim to it. For many oyster farmers, life can be a perpetual challenge: long, lonely days working the leases, juggling production, seeding the crop, grading and regrading the oysters, harvesting, cleaning, packing, managing sales and accounts all the time trying to innovate and update the technology, husbandry and operations of the business. Although many in the contemporary media like to propagate the romantic notion of the artisan's solo farmer as being the exclusive custodians of quality, there is a new breed of corporate farmer who are providing a platform for artisan growers like John to blossom. South Coast-based operation Australia's Oyster Coast is one such Having purchased John's famous Mimosa Rocks farm business, they have given him the opportunity, resources and commercial support to take his artisan approach to oyster farming into the next generation of commercial production. Yeah, well, look, it was hard, John, you know, like at many sleepless nights and, you know, like, I've, as you well know, I, I spoke to you at length and um, for some guidance there. But, um, 
I guess one, you know, like, and, and credit to you, one, one of the great things you said to me um, was, you know, John, don't be necessarily disappointed and see it as a failure, but, you know, also look towards um, what you may achieve and, and, and the things that you can do within an organisation like Australia's Oyster Coast. And, and so I thought about that in the, in the context of your own words. But, um, you know, like putting a, building a business from the ground up, like literally, John, from the ground up, you know, from the mud up, there was not a pole in the water. You know, I had no infrastructure. I had nothing. You know, I liquidated everything, you know, and given this property market, I'd be well retired if, if I had not. Um, but um, it's just one of those things, you know, and, and I had to deliver on some things. We had some, some tough years. And, I, and my last year was a good one, but, you know, I could see that a lot of things were up for replacement. I had to make, you know, some pretty hefty um, investments in the business and, and I just looked at my wife and I looked at my family and I thought, you know what, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've put them, you know, through enough already um, and it's, you know, it's, it's time to make good on a few promises that I made, you know, quite a while quite a while back to my wife so you know moving forward of you know moving to that position with um australia's oyster coast so so it's about resetting you know and, and okay it's about letting go um and so it's not mimosa anymore you know i think if if you carry carry all that baggage through then it, it doesn't do you any good you know i i needed to see it for what it is um and just accepting the process um and and be, you know, um, accepting of, of, of the business um, and then thinking, you know, how can I make, you know, make this place better? You know, how, how can I carry on my legacy? Um, and I can do that in multiple ways by, by training people, you know, by, by sharing that information about curating oysters through the early stages of husbandry. Um, it's about bringing people into the business from the community, you know, offering them a career path. You know, based on based on my words, my motivation. You know, my sales pitch, and then it's about making good on that, John. Um, and and so I guess you know that's that's what I look at. You know, that's 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 what gets me out of bed. You know, is is that I've got people now that rely on me, and and if you know I decide to walk away tomorrow, I need to be sure that they'll be able to maintain their momentum, you know, and, and I just don't think they're there yet, you know. So, and I think I've still got a bit more to offer. So, you know, that, that's, that's just, that's, yeah, that, so it's, it's, it's you know, it's quite, it's, yeah. So it, it, the compass is slightly orientated in a different direction, but, you know, it's, it's, it's still got truth and it's still got value in its integrity. So, um I'm tr- yeah, I'm trying to bring that forward and change people's perception, you know. There's a lot of naysayers and detractors around, you know, and I've been caught up in this too with, you know, big business, corporate corporate um, structures and things like that. But it's, you know, but it doesn't have to be that way, you know. I, I guess, you know, there is always a changing of the guard and no one's really done what we've done, become, you know, really the first vertically integrated business for oysters. There's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, you know, there's others out there now. Um, but you know, behind every successful business are the people. And so, you know, if you invest in your people and, and by investing in, I mean, by, you know, training them and, and, and mentoring, then, you know, then, then there's hope. So the challenges that I face, the choke points and, and, the, and the stresses that I faced as an independent, uh, you know, I felt in a vertically integrated business like ours, you know, it's, it's just on a bigger scale. Um, but it's about, I guess, cha- changing your mindset a little bit, you know, now I'm invested in, I'm super invested in the oyster. Okay. I'm probably a little, little less hands-on just due to the scale of, you know, like, so I move away from, um, sort of I'm not so much a, of an artisan you know for want of a better word at the moment but what I am doing is developing people and what I am doing is developing culture and I'm also 
you know, through conversations with yourself and continued conversations with Chef, developing the idea, ideas and concepts that um, are so important to, you know, achieving a great rock oyster in, you know, in, 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 in those outcomes. So um, just, a, you know, just a, a different, you know, a different, you know, suite of challenges. Like all producers of premium foods and beverages, it is an imperative that the progressive rock oyster farmer is tapped into the contemporary consumer trends, tastes and demands. These demands not only need to engage with the chefs and consumers, but to also have an ability to interpret the trends and render a means to communicate the unique selling points of the oysters they grow. The modern oyster farmer is as much a storyteller as a grower of shellfish. I eat a lot of oysters. Part of being a farmer is, you know, you've got to, you've got to be sampling your wear, right? Um, but, you know, when an oyster's in condition, I say I'm up, you know, there's been times I've just been sitting up the front of Nelson Lagoon or up the entrance of Wapango, you know, and you've picked a couple of oysters and you're just sitting there, you know, and just on the, on the sand, no one around. And, um, yeah, and you're just breaking it all down and then you're looking across, you know, the catchment and you're thinking about these things at play, you know, you're wondering how do they work, you know, how have those flavours arrived in this oyster, you know, and, and yeah, that, you know, it's a bit dreamy, yeah, I know, but, you know, you've got to romanticise, you know, it's, it's like artistry, right, you know, like you've got to be creative and in order to be creative, you need to think, deeply about something and and then carry that forward you know one of the highlights of um, you know my time you know with my own business mimosa you know like i just touched on it briefly before but um that interaction with the consumer and the chef you know those people who want to engage with you and hear about the story that that's that's key you know that's you know that um i'm extremely grateful that there's people um who who want to hear the who hear that story because it drives the industry forward you know working with chefs um like josh nyland you know people like yourself john sussman um people who care you know because they promote the story because they get it and they see the the um fertility that is the rock oyster industry but they also see you know, um, the value in, you know, in, in, in the species and, and then um, in, in supporting farmers. Um, so, yeah, it, I, think it's, it, I think it's critical. I, you know, you, you need people out there championing the industry because without it, you know, you, you're nameless. And, um, and then you leave it up to other people who, who don't have that connection. You know, like you kick it down the road to a fishmonger who, who he only he just wants to clip the ticket. No offense, fishmongers, but not many, mm-hmm. not many fishmongers I've ever met, if any, are, are connected to the environment and the wild in the fashion that I am. And and there lies the difference. You know, I can tell the story all day, every day, because I am the story. You know, I lo- I live it, I breathe it, and it influences the way in which I live, um, more so than price because I love the job, you know what I mean? But um, so having that ability to, yeah, talk about it and and have that experience where I can tell the story, it's, it's important, you know, and, and you can't do that without an engaging consumer base. Um, just the other night, actually, John, I got a message from a guy on Instagram. He DM'd me. He's... Um, down on the peninsula at a restaurant and he's seen some Appalachian oysters and he, and he messaged me. And, you know, he, he was a follower of me when I was – I used to supply him direct as Mimosa. You know, he said, oh, me and my wife, we're Devo, but, um, but you're no longer, you know, carrying on with Mimosa. And I said, oh, I'm devastated too to some degree, but, you know, I've moved on. But, you know, I appreciate the fact that we're still in contact because it's that connection, you know. It's elevated his experience. He's got a bit of understanding. You know, so he sits around, he has that oyster, and he, he thinks about me. That's great. He thinks about the environment, and he gets it, you know, and that's what we want. So, you know, how, do, how, can, we, how can we influence more people to be that way-minded, you know what I mean? I think that's, that's the way forward.
I think that's that's a great challenge. Maintaining quality and production levels in an industry which is centred on the most populated section of Australian coast is a challenge for the rock oyster farmers and industry managers at all levels. Research programs focusing on improved cultivation techniques, stock genetics, habitat improvement and protection and better disease control are essential to ensuring the continued viability of Australia's oldest and New South Wales' most valuable aquaculture industry. The future for rock oyster farming is very exciting. The sustainable food movement is surging and Sydney rock oysters are touted as being the golden egg of oysters worldwide. Well, hopefully well, hopefully the rock oyster continues to be elevated and and highlighted as a, you know, a, a, a premium product. Um, I guess not all rock oysters are created the same, so, you know, there's there's always um, varying percentages of, of where of, of what grade ends up in what particular market and you know let's face it the high-end restaurant um, um, range is, is, a, is a small percentage um, you know and wholesale is pretty much where it's at but um, for a lot of farmers but look I just I just hope there's a lot more support you know and given um, you know the environmental um, constraints that we've had you know I'd urge farmers personally um, to you know, look towards more strategic ways into which they they grow oysters. You know, like I, about reflecting on on the environment, and the ecology, and the ecology, and trying to understand the critical food webs. Knowing an oyster, um, what an oyster feeds on, you know, is is important knowledge. You know, and 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 recognizing um, influxes and inputs, whether it's upwelling or watershed. You know, all these critical drivers that can you know. Um, enhance growth potentially, you know, and strategize around that. You know, y- you could look at some years where, okay, we've th- the science is leaning towards we can stock s- slightly high densities, but then the science will dictate one year, okay, well let's lighten it up. So it's about maximizing, you know, y- your your profit for your business. Um, in a sustainable, sustainable, manage, manage, manageable way that doesn't impact um, negatively on, you know, on your neighbours as well. Um, so I, I just think we, you know, we, yeah, we need to get a bit smarter, John, and um, because you know we, we're getting smaller and smaller windows when we can, you know, kick oysters out to market, you know, and and then we, we've seen, you know huge amount of fresh water in the in, in the estuaries which you know places a lot of stress um on the oyster um you know places like port stevens has you know experienced huge losses with disease if with qx um it's it's about trying to you know de-risk and strategize i just think we, we you know we need we need to really recognize what's happening in the natural world and 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 work with it because otherwise nature's just going to flick us off its back so it's it's no different than than us walking around on the land john um i think you need to be in tune and um that would be my message to all farmers is is um turn up when the industry's trying to scale up and what we need is not only do we need um physical and able bodies but we also need some really good minds about us as well so you know whether you know we um, align ourselves with tertiary institutions john you know um you know provide clear pathways and you know and and option you know and and provide um areas of you know if growth and careers within aquaculture specifically oysters you know that so you've got someone young, but, it, but they've got a future. They're not just going to be a farmhand. It's about, you know, creating a, a pathway for them. Um, I think, you know, that's, that's, that's a great challenge. Always was a great challenge with me with Mimosa, you know, like because, you know, you rely a lot on casual-based and then because it's seasonal, you know, you know, you make a lot of money one year in a very short period of time. One year you don't make any money. It's, so, uh, you know, you, you've got to contend with that too, but... Um, yeah, it'd be it'd be great if um, it'd be great if we could work more closely with yeah TAFE or or you know universities and in in trying to develop you know other pathways and 
things like that. The Sydney rock oyster industry is in an exciting place. Many farmers have become quite innovative, not only in their husbandry and technology, but in the way they communicate with the market, using social media to target specific markets and thinking of other ways to move their stock. The things I really enjoy about oyster farming, you know, and it's different a lot, you know, like my idea of oyster farming when I came in um, to being an oyster farmer was, was a need to, to remove myself almost from society to get away from people. Um, and when you're in the natural world and out on the lake, you know, you find yourself by yourself. And, and I love being in my own space, um, first and foremost. And then I love the communion that happens within nature. You know, so, you know, you, you pick up on, it might be a bird flying over your head, you know, or these um, subtle seasonal variances that, that, you know, that, that you notice on the lake. You know, it's, it's, that's what I love about um, rock oyster farming. I, I, love, I love the process of growing a rock oyster, that, you know, husbandry, shaping an oyster, um, and, and thinking about how can I make this oyster in the vision of, of, of what I perceive to be a perfect oyster. And, and how can I um, present this on the plate and how can I... Um, how can I tell the story of, of my life and the challenges of farming and, and you know, that, that, and, and, and all the trials and tribulations that, that, it, that it takes to, to, you know, bring an oyster to market? So, you know, it's, it's, it's once again, it's a myriad of things, but, um, yeah, but it mostly about being outside. And, but more, more so this day and age, which, which, I, which I find <laughs> a bit interesting is, is, the ability to to tell a story, you know, it's not it's it's something that you know is a bit contradictory to my to my initial ideas. Um, you know, I I never saw myself as someone who really wanted to talk about the story of provenance and uh, inspiring people, you know, and and talking about the the industry um, and trying to promote the industry. Um, not 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 that I, I was selfish or anything like that, but it but it but more so that. You know, I was shying away from, you know, coming from a, a big commercial business and plumbing and you know, dealing with government and this, that and the other thing. I, I just wanted to, you know, pull myself away from that. But, but then in finding passion and excitement in, in the natural world and about, you know, growing something such as something such as great as the rock oyster, then, you know, it naturally you want to inspire and, and, and tell people of that, about that because you're wanting to promote industry. You're wanting to support your community. You're wanting to support the other farmers on the estuary um, and right up and down the eastern seaboard of Australia. It's more about seeing purpose in, in bringing people through. Um, still super connected to the story of growing oysters and I want to continue to champion that message of the environment and the environment in which oysters are grown because I think that's important, you know, bringing people back to the wild and giving them that understanding of, of the nature in which an oyster is, you know, where, it, where it's grown is important. Um, but then, you know, just making that message infectious throughout, throughout the team and, you know, throughout talking to people like you and your listeners. Um, so then when they make all the all-important decisions as the consumer, you know, am I going to spend a couple of bucks extra on this oyster or this per dozen or whatever? It's justified because they understand it, you know what I mean? But, but let them challenge, you know, the, the, the person selling it at the point of sale, you know, to get that story. And if they don't, you know, let them ask why, you know, because they're the questions that need to be asked. You know, like, I can kick tyres all day and, 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 and talk on this podcast and talk to these people over there, but people don't listen, you know, and, and, and through this production, you know, it'll resonate get, and you reach people. And I just hope that, you know, people take, hear that message and, and then they act on that message. There is generally a feeling of optimism for the industry and with the passion, professionalism and commitment of growers like John Blankenstein, coupled with the support, infrastructure and commitment of a corporate structure such as Australia's Oyster Coast, 
The Rock Oyster is rightly enjoying a renaissance of appreciation as one of the great shellfish experiences on the planet. This is Fish Tales, a seafood podcast. A Deep in the Weeds production, I'm John Sussman. Follow us on Instagram at Fishtails Seafood Podcast or email us at fishtailspodcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay tuned for more tales from beneath the surface of the seafood world every Friday on your podcast app.